Today, we're going to be looking at the National Video Game Museum, which is where I work. My name is Connor Clark, and I'm going to give you a tour of the museum today. It's kind of like cribs, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like gaming cribs, <laughs> museum cribs, I suppose. The museum isn't open yet, so it might look a little bit quiet, but it is going to be very loud because, well, video games are quite loud. First thing you see when you get into the museum is this machine here, which is Racket, okay, this game. Uh, Racket is a rocket ship flying game. Um, it's quite, quite simple, but it's slightly complicated in how you control the rocket ship. So if you have a look here, uh, instead of using a normal controller, we've employed a Makey Makey to turn various fruits and vegetables into the controller. Uh, we feel this exemplifies what the museum wants to do, which instead of having a kind of a, a chronological look at video games from the start to the end, uh, which is great, uh, we actually want to kind of deconstruct and kind of explode what people might expect from video games. So this is playing around with what we think a controller can be. So we press the spoon to start, um, and then we can use the banana and the orange to actually fly our rocket and see if we can land on the blue platform there. We're gonna crash, but we've got way more to see, so let's not dwell on this too much. So the way the museum is constructed is that we have different bundles of video games, each tied together by a certain concept. This could be anything, really. Um, this first bundle is called You Are Here, which are all games that have been made in Sheffield and that have kind of become super, super successful. Um, the first one we see is Tangled, which is made by Matt Phillips. This is just a small demo I use to teach programming. A few other games on the You Are Here bundle are some games from Sumo Digital, which are one of the biggest UK game development studios and are literally based just down the road. Uh, but also we have Zool, which are from which was made by Gremlin Graphics, which is obviously a highly, highly influential uh, video game company. So there's a few other bundles you might be able to see, such as uh, Words Per Minute, which is all about typing video games. There's the Tough Bundle, which is all about really, really hard games. There's a brilliant bundle here, which is actually done in partnership with Special Effects. Special Effects are a charity that create controllers for people with uh, perhaps disabilities, physical disabilities. They might not be able to kind of play games in the tr using traditional controllers. So they worked with Xbox to create this thing right here. This is the Xbox Adaptive Controller. Essentially, you can use a 3.5 millimeter input, just as you would for kind of any headphones or audio, and you can plug anything in that control all of the different buttons. So we've got like kind of the, the, the right D-pad button, the up D-pad button, uh, the down D-pad button, all across the kind of the Y, X, and B buttons as well. So essentially, we can play Forza Horizon using just this joystick. It controls every aspect of the car, and you can basically just fly around the uh, the wilderness of Scotland. It's brilliant for people that might have kind of disabilities and aren't able to play games in the traditional ways. Alongside our bundles, we also have uh, other kind of games that are really cool and often that you can only play here in the museum. Uh, one of them, uh, which you can actually play at home, so I think it's on the, uh, the, 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 the App Store, um, but not in this way, it's called Inks. Now this is a very large digital pinball machine. So using Inks, you can play pinball but it works with paint and we can kind of digitally paint on the screen whilst playing pinball. It's really really cool how it works. It's a very very large iPad. You can even see the, the top of the screen there and it's put in this huge kind of built pinball machine with buttons on either side and it's it's amazing. It's really really cool. Oh, I'm, just, I'm no good at pinball. There we go. So one of the missions of the museum is to collect and preserve gaming ephemera and gaming memorabilia from all across kind of uh, video game history. So we have our kind of quite traditional museum-y things and we have these big glass cabinets where we have all of our, uh, what we think are really kind of influential gaming objects, such as the Magnavox Odyssey, which is the first ever video game console. It was actually released in 1972 and was made by Ralph Baer. We have some special editions here. The, uh, the, the Master Chief helmet is a kind of particularly uh, favorite one of mine, but other stuff like this, the Fallout Pit-Boy and the Call of Duty special editions. We have a handheld gaming exhibit here with various Game Boys, but also kind of other things such as the Barcode Battler, uh, Astro Wars, smaller kind of video game consoles. We also have a very, very pretty PlayStation Portable that is probably one of my favorite items in the entirety of the museum. So this is all but kind of a small part of our collection, really. We have a lot of other things that we're storing in Nottingham in one of our big kind of collections that we're hosting with the universities over there. This is our Versus cabinet, uh, which is all about kind of Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter 2. Which one were you? Were you Super Nintendo or Master System or Mega Drive? I personally was a Super Nintendo, the SNES, with Street Fighter 2. Um, however, I get a lot of stick for that here at the museum, but you know. 
And then we have a controller section as well, uh, all about different controllers we have, including some wireless Atari controllers, which is, is really, really cool and from the kind of the 70s. One of the big flagship exhibits we have in the museum is Platform 14, which is the, all of these kind of huge screens we have along the side here. Uh, this exhibit explores the concept of porting a video game. And the video game we've chosen to start with is Donkey Kong. So, we have the original kind of arcade version of Donkey Kong right here. It's a very pretty looking game, uh, released kind of in 1981 in the arcades. Um, but it was so successful that everybody wanted a piece of it and they wanted to port it to each one of the different consoles. So what we've done is we've got other versions, other ports of that game playable along these screens. So alongside the original arcade, we have the NES version, we have the Commodore 64 version, we have the Game Boy version, the Atari 2600 and 7800 as well. And my particular favorite is this one, the TRS-80 version. When you compare this to the original arcade, it is vastly different in regards to kind of graphics and also in regards to the sound but it still plays and feels like Donkey Kong, which I think is a testament to the nature of the port. I don't want to show myself up because I'm actually not very good at Donkey Kong. It's an incredibly difficult game. So I know you got them all running on the same kind of controller. I mean, was that, is that a tricky thing to do? <laughs> not particularly, no. So they are all, the, the, these versions are all emulated. We actually have a mixture of emulated uh, games and games running on their natural hardware, such as the Mario and Sonic exhibit right here. The reason we do that is because we're able to play around with games a little bit more. For example, with this kind of screen here, if we were to have each of these running on their original hardwares, they all have different resolutions that they play at, and it's not easy to kind of compare the differences. So if we emulate them, we're very easily able to compare what are the graphical differences of each game. This cabinet kind of explores why we need a video game museum. For example, we do have the pre-owned prices of some FIFA games here that obviously last year's instalment, FIFA 19, were £25. But the soon as you get to the next one after that, FIFA 18, it drops significantly. And by the time we get to FIFA 15, they're worth pennies. We don't think video games, even old video games, are worth pennies. We think they all should be saved. We also have a lot of our broken stuff here. Um, obviously, because we have lots and lots of people coming in, playing all of our games, we go through a lot of controllers and a lot of hardware very quickly. Oftentimes, we're able to recycle those or use those in other ways but sometimes we just keep the broken ones and then we exhibit them as well on this back wall we do have a bunch of arcade machines as well uh, wouldn't be a video game museum without a few kind of classic arcade cabinets such as space invaders we have miss pac-man and another donkey kong just for good measure um, one thing we really like is this uh, cabinet over here, which is Dancing Stage Fusion, or it was known as uh, DDR um, in other places outside of the UK. So, what's really fun about this is that one time it broke and we had to get inside and kind of have a play around with it and make see if we could fix it. And we found, as we were playing around with it, that there was a slot for a PlayStation 2 memory card. And upon closer inspection, we actually found that this entire machine is essentially a commercial PS2 running inside of it. Um, it's no different to a normal PS2. You can even plug controllers in, you can plug in other memory cards with your high scores from other machines. Yeah. But then we get over here, which is uh, probably my favorite part of the museum. It's called the lab because it is about exploring what makes a video game and kind of distilling it down. Uh, so we do have a lot of old development units, um, which you might have seen before, but they're all really interesting. There's an old Nintendo Dolphin and the GameCube test kit there, the DS test kit. We do have the old PlayStation 2 development kit as well. Funny story behind this one. This was originally from Free Radical, which is a studio that was based in Nottingham in the UK. This machine itself actually was used to make the original Time Splitters game on PlayStation 2. So I took a picture of this uh, unit and posted it on social media um, from the museum because I thought it was really fun and it's a cool little looking unit. And we had someone that used to work for Free Radical comment on that tweet saying, oh, was that one of the units that was stolen? It was like, oh, what? Stolen? Really? Why? I didn't collect this, this machine, so I had no idea if it was stolen or not. But there were a few development kits that were stolen around a similar time. This isn't one of them. I made sure of it, but there was a panic in my chest that we were holding stolen goods at the museum for a split second. But I'm fine now. As well as exhibiting the past uh, and present of video games, we also want to have a quick peek into the future of games here at the museum as well. So we have this section here, uh, which is all about in development and currently unreleased games. Essentially, we as a museum reach out to independent creators of video games, small teams, and we say, we really like your work. 
how would you feel about us exhibiting it in a museum so people can see a game in progress? These include games such as Aerobat, Super Lunary, which is a fascinating little game. One of my favorite ones of these in development games is something like Drink More Glut, which is this fun little Olympic style party game, which is really fun. And we get so many people coming in and playing these games and having such a fun time. And what we can do uh, is, is ask those people about feedback on these games. So if they really like Drink More Glut or, or maybe they didn't like something about Drink More Glut, we can take that on board and then we can even feed that back to the creators as well. Y velocity to eight. And then we're going to enter this infinite loop here. So we're going to add the player's X velocity to Z0. I'm going to add the player's Y velocity to D1. And then we're going to jump back up and we're going to The problem is there, you have to go right from the very end of the game, which in chess you, you can't do. There's just, just too many possibilities. Um...